the final holiday of this long holiday season is the holiday of Simchas Torah. It's a holiday unto itself, not just the last days of Sukkot. And what it is, is a lot of dancing, a lot of joy, celebrating the completion of the reading of the Torah. Because we read a portion every week on Shabbos, and uh, it takes a, a year from Simchas Torah to Simchas Torah, and on this day we finish reading the entire Torah and start all over again. The obvious question is, and there's always a question, right? The obvious question is, what does this have to do with the season? The Torah was given in the spring on Shavuos. So wouldn't it make more sense to begin the study of the Torah, or the reading of the Torah on Shavuos and finish it on Shavuos? Why are we celebrating the Torah after Yom Kippur? Because everything in, in, in Torah, everything in the practice of Torah is meaningful and purposeful and uh, necessary. So why is it right and necessary to celebrate the completion of the Torah after Yom Kippur rather than Shavuos? So let's take a deeper look. The relationship between Jews and Torah works two ways, like every relationship, of course. Is the Torah necessary for the benefit of the Jews? Or are the Jewish people necessary for the benefit of the Torah? It's a very good question. And there are good arguments on both sides. Because what would the Torah be if there is no Jew to keep it? And on the other hand, what would a Jew be if he didn't have a Torah to follow, to fulfill? So the relationship is a two-way relationship. There is the aspect where Torah benefits from the Jewish people, and there is the aspect where the Jewish people benefit from the Torah. Now, listen to this amazing, amazing idea. What are the last words in the Torah, the concluding words of the entire Torah? A praise of Moshe, his greatness, his passing away. There will never be another prophet like Moshe. But then it goes on to say, because of all the wondrous things that he did in the awesome wilderness in front of the eyes of the entire people. So we have here three elements. Number one, all the miracles that he performed in, in Egypt, the miracles that he performed in the wilderness, and something he did in the presence of all the Jews. What did he do in the presence of all the Jews? He broke the tablets when he came down off the mountain the first time. He saw that the Jews had made a golden calf, and he dropped the tablets, the Ten Commandments, and he broke them. And this was in the presence of all the Jews. When he broke them, God thanked him for doing that. So it's a great compliment to Moshe that God approved of what he did. And why did he do it? Because his heart moved him to do it. He was inspired to do it. He wasn't told to do it. But after he did it, God approved and thanked him for doing it, blessed him for doing it. So, to make that a little more understandable, the words of the Torah are something awesome and wonderful that Moshe did in the presence of all the Jews. How does that in any way suggest that Moshe was great because God approved and, and blessed him for doing it? And also, if you want to say that breaking 
the commandments was a good thing, then say it. Why is it couched in the words, something he did in the presence of all the Jews? How significant is it that it was in the presence of all the Jews? So, briefly, to sum it all up, there are two reasons that uh, Moshe broke the tablets. Two reasons that are given. One is, he figured something so precious and so holy shouldn't really be given to people who are so low and so sinful. It's beneath the dignity and the honor of Torah to be given to people who don't deserve it. And so he broke them. The other reason given is because in the Ten Commandments, there is the commandment, thou shalt make no graven images. The Jews had just made a graven image. So to hand the Ten Commandments over to the Jewish people would be like signing the, doc, the, the contract in which they agree not to do that, and then having done it, they would be held liable for idolatry. So Moshe said, I'm canceling the contract. So if God is angry at the people, Moshe will say, well, the contract was never delivered. So the agreement was never sealed. So they can be forgiven. These two reasons represent the two dimensions of the relationship. In the first reason, the Torah is too holy to be given to people who are not deserving. Well, what that says is that the Torah comes first, and those who are deserving of it might receive the gift of the Torah. But if you're not deserving, you don't get it. The other reason suggests the opposite, that the Torah is there to benefit the Jewish people. If it doesn't benefit the Jewish people, then, then we don't need it. If it's not going to help make the Jewish people God's people, then, then what's the point of it? And so Moshe canceled it. Which of the two is the primary reason? That the Torah is holy and therefore should not be given to people who are not deserving doesn't justify breaking the, the tablets. Okay, don't give it to them. But why are you breaking them? In other words, if the Torah is primary, then there's no justification for breaking the commandments, which is the Torah. On the contrary, the Torah is so great and so holy that only people who deserve can get it. Well, then why are you breaking them? So it's a good reason not to deliver them, not to hand them over, but it doesn't explain breaking them. The second reason, that if it doesn't help the Jewish people, then it's not necessary because the purpose of Torah is to bring out the potential in the Jewish people as, as the chosen people. Well, then if that's not going to happen, then there's absolutely no value or purpose in having the Torah on earth. So by breaking it, he basically said, let the Torah remain in heaven. What does this have to do with Simchas Torah? The sages use an example that when the father gets angry at his child because the child did something uh, inappropriate, the anger can be so intense that the father actually says, leave my house, don't come back, I am not your father anymore. That causes the son to deeply regret what he did and insist on being readmitted or taken back. Meaning, whatever motivated the son to do something wrong was only the external part of his personality, of his mentality, of his psyche. But when he hears that his father doesn't want to be his father, this is so unacceptable and intolerable to the son that there is no way that he can accept that. And so he does whatever is possible to be re-accepted, to be 
returned to his father's home. In other words, tshuva. So what happens? When the father says, you're not my son anymore, what he's trying to do is stimulate the part of the soul of the child that cannot, can't not be my father's child. I can be good, I can be bad, I can be holy, I can be unholy, I can be difficult, I can be pleasant. I can't not be your son. So you can hate me, you can, you can be disappointed with me, and that won't make me repent or regret as deeply as the thought that we're, we're not related anymore. But that can't be. So that touches the very core of the soul of the son and reveals his true essential being, who he really is. Rosh Hashanah, the 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, that's all about tshuva. It's all about return, repenting, repairing the relationship with God. What does that do? It cuts to the essence of the, of the nature of a Jew. A Jew is connected to God not by observing the commandments, not by studying the Torah, not by serving God, the idea of a chosen people means you're the one, you're it. You will do well or you will do poorly, but you are it. Why? Because the soul of a Jew is a little piece of God. But that's not always experienced in the conscious mind. Just like a child is not always conscious of the significance of his relationship with his father or mother. And that's why children can do things that are so hurtful, so painful to the parents that the parents' reaction is, you can't possibly be mine. Because if you were truly mine, you would never, you could never do that. So actually we're seeing two very uh, profound realities. One is that the father can't tolerate losing the son and the son cannot tolerate losing his father. When that reality is revealed, then we realize that in the relationship between ourselves and the Torah, the Torah is given to us not to make us Jewish, not to make us God's children, but because we are God's children. And the Torah is to bring out all the potential that this relationship uh, contains. So it turns out that on Simchas Torah, when we conclude the study of Torah and we get to the final punchline, what do we realize? We realize that the Torah is blessed by the Jewish people who observe it or keep it, or study it, or treasure it. Because the Jewish people make the Torah come alive and give it its validity. So when Moshe broke the tablets, he was saying, the Jews are what make the Torah special. And without the Jews, the Torah loses all meaning. Where do we see this? Sounds a little extreme. Every instruction if in Torah is worded, is addressed to the Jewish people. God spoke to Moshe and said, speak to the children of Israel and tell them to do such and such. In other words, the Torah is there to allow every talent, every ability, every godly instinct, every godly potential in the Jewish soul to be revealed and acted upon. So every mitzvah in the Torah says, here's another way you can express the godliness within you. In fact, there are 613 ways that the potential of a Jewish soul can be actualized, expressed, and realized. So if the Jew is not going to be there, then the Torah loses all 
its function, all its purpose on earth. Of course, it will still be precious to God, but it would have no function on earth. So what happens on Simchas Torah? It's not that we are so thrilled to have concluded the study. It's that the Torah is so validated, the Torah becomes so real when it is revealed to the world that it exists to serve the Jewish people as an outlet to the potential godliness that the Jewish soul contains. Now it also makes sense why it's necessarily in the presence of all the people. That puts the emphasis on for the benefit of the Jewish people. Not for the benefit of the Torah, but for the benefit of the people. He did it in the presence of the people, letting them know that they are the, the center of godliness, the presence of godliness on earth, and the Torah was given to them so that it can enhance and facilitate the expression of that godliness into physical human behavior. So the joy is the joy of the realization of who we are. And that doesn't happen until after we do tshuva, until after we deeply regret the separation from God, the uh, alienation from God, and we realize that it can't be. We can't be separated. And that whatever separations we cause with our sins, that's only on the surface. But in the essence, we can't not be related to God. That is not a possibility. And when we realize that, then we realize how, what a gift and what a blessing the Torah is for us. And that gives the Torah its validity. If the Torah was celebrated on Shavuos, that would bring out the importance of the Torah and its superiority to the people. But after Tshuva, after Yom Kippur, comes Simchas Torah, and it brings out the centrality of the Jewish soul that is enhanced by the Torah. This explains a very current and interesting phenomenon. In the Soviet Union, in the bad, bad old days, <laughs> today it's not so good either, but in the bad, bad old days, Jews were so alienated from Torah. Under the communist system, they were educated as communists and as atheists. And yet something strange would happen on Simchas Torah in Moscow. On that night and no other, young Jews would gather in front of the synagogue, the one synagogue that the communists allowed to exist, just to show how tolerant they were. Young Jews would gather by the thousands and sing and dance, even spill over into the streets because it was Simchas Torah. How do we understand this? Where is this coming from? And why Simchas Torah? Not even Yom Kippur got that kind of a reaction. But now we understand, on Simchas Torah, we experience that relationship with God that cannot be severed. We can't not be connected. Communism says, we're going to sever your relationship with God. We're going to alienate you completely and God is not your father anymore. Simchas Torah came along and someplace deep in the psyche of the Jewish soul, there was a rebellion that said, no, that can't be. Can't be. I am so alienated. I'm so far removed from any Jewish practice, from any Jewish knowledge and awareness that it's almost like God is not my father anymore. Oh, no, that can't be. 
that cannot be. And so they were moved to come and dance and sing, and they didn't know why they were doing it. Because in their conscious mind, it didn't make any sense. So the day before, they would insist, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in this, this is old-fashioned, this is uh, archaic, and all the things that they were taught. That's the day before. And the next day on Simchas Torah, they come, and at a great risk, they could be thrown out of school, they could lose their jobs. They gather in front of the synagogue and sing and dance like the holiest of Jews. Because when it touches the core, well, nothing can destroy that. And so the joy is also without restraints and without limits. It's the very core. It's the very essence. It's the whole package. And so the Torah is rejoicing with the Jewish people and wants to dance. And so what do we do? We hold the Torah in our arms and we dance because the Torah doesn't have feet and can't dance by itself no matter how happy it is. So we dance with the Torah or we dance for the Torah. We give the Torah the opportunity to dance. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best, and join us for some enjoyable conversation.